I wasn't exactly clear what I was supposed to talk about, so I just kind of modestly uh, have titled this presentation the answers to all your questions in under 20 minutes. And uh, questions like, um, what does it take for a startup to succeed, just generally, um, and then specifically, why is distribution so hard? Um, should I hire a sales team? You know, how do I set it up? What's the trade-off between sales and virality? Should I just try to be viral? Should I do sales? Um, you can tell I, I wrote this myself. So, uh, uh, and then you know, should I actually? Let's say you do hire a sales team. Should you listen to your sales team? You know, that's actually a big question because um, sometimes your sales team will tell you to go in very different directions than your product team. So, how do you do that? Let's go back. Sorry, I don't know why it's flipped. Presentation, there we go. Uh, and then finally, uh, what was in the water at PayPal? I just thought I'd throw that in, uh, this kind of unrelated question. But actually, it does relate to this topic of distribution. I'll come back and explain that at the end. So um, this is kind of my framework for how I view uh, whether a startup idea is a good idea. You know, people ask me kind of all the time like to evaluate their startup ideas. And this is kind of the mental model I run through, which is, you know, it starts with the entrepreneur identifies a market need. And so, uh, well, before that's kind of founder fantasy land, you know, if you go to any of the like founder conferences, you know, there's a lot of people running around wanting to be founders. Uh, the first thing you have to do is identify a market need. And, you know, hopefully it's a market that uh, you have some sort of uh, deep intuitive knowledge, sort of there's founder market fit, it's a real need, it's a large market, um, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, once you have that, you have to figure out a specific product incarnation to, uh, to kind of get... Uh, to get people to uh, onboard uh, your, your, your product. And the reason I call it a hook is because it's really about creating a simple product experience that will, uh, it's a simple interaction or behavior that you can get users to engage in. Uh, because frequently I see people who have, a, they have identified a market that really does need, that's, that's sort of inefficient and in need of uh, being disrupted, but they haven't really figured out a, a way to get users uh, to sign up and start using the product. And you know, throwing the kitchen sink at the problem doesn't really solve it because if you can't get users to engage in a simple behavior, chances are that making your product more complex isn't going to solve that problem. And so it's really about figuring out what's the initial simple behavior that I can realistically get a user to engage in, and then over time you increase the surface area of your product. So, you know, with PayPal, it was, you know, could we get users to, to email money, right? You put it in someone's email address and a credit card and dollar amount, and it, that's a simple enough behavior that realistically, you know, I could believe people would, in, would engage with it. Um, you know, or, or Twitter, it's posting a status update, or with, um, you know, uh, same thing with Yammer, it's posting, you know, what are you working on? There's a simple behavior that gets the user uh, immediately engaged, and over time, we can uh, add to the product. The third thing is, is a scalable distribution model. If you want to create a really big company in a relatively short amount of time, like, you know, say five years, something like that, um, you have to be able to get to a lot of people. You know, the consumer space is typically hundreds of millions of users. Uh, in the enterprise space, it's about two orders of magnitude less, you know, but you've got to still get into the millions of, of corporate users if you want to create a, a multi-billion dollar company. And so, you know, how do you reach that many people in a, in a short amount of time? I actually think this is probably, this is, I think, the most underrated um, problem, and I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation talking about it. Uh, and then the, the final thing is non-copyability, which is, you know, once you've figured out all these things, you know, how do you actually prevent uh, other companies, larger, bigger companies, uh, from just copying you and absorbing you, featurizing you, making, their, making you part of their suite? Uh, and, uh, you know, another, as Warren Buffett says, what's the mode around your business? And so, you know, this is also a very big problem that I think people tend to underrate because um, they kind of just assume that if they have the first mover advantage, they're the first ones to figure out these problems, that they'll just win. And it's not actually true all the time. Um, we forget about all the companies that have just been sort of copied to death and, until they, they don't have any value. And you know, it's, it's useful to keep in mind that with software, it's, it's just fundamentally very easy to copy software. I, I, I don't mean pirate. I just mean that anyone can look at your product, your interface, and create their own version of it um, pretty, pretty easily. So you've really got to figure out over time what's going to prevent your, especially if you're in the enterprise, what's going to prevent your pricing power from eroding as more entrants come into, into the market. And if you can do all four of those things, you end up with a, a multi-billion dollar company. Um, so I want to, like I mentioned, I want to talk about distribution. You know, why is this such a, a tough problem? And I think it, it comes down to, to this. I, I'm sort of calling it the law of distribution arbitrage, which is that when somebody does come up with a successful distribution technique, it just gets copied to death. Everyone does it. And so what happens is it gets copied until all the advantage in that distribution technique kind of gets arbed out, right? Until it's not unusually effective. So, 
Um, let's take you know Facebook platform in the early days, right? I mean, everyone launched their apps, and the first people to do it got to you know explosive numbers of users. But then over time, it became much less viral as uh, as users of Facebook stopped responding to, um, to the various viral channels on Facebook. Same thing with the early social networks. I don't know if you remember like the days of like Plaxo or there's these address book importers where they would sort of induce you or trick you into slurping up your whole address book and then spam out the whole address book. That worked really well in the early days, but uh, you know, you'd have like 7% conversion rates like that and it would be explosively viral. But over time, um, users or consumers became inured to that to that, and the viral channel got burned out, and people stopped clicking on those viral invites, that would no longer be a, a viral distribution strategy anymore. So, you know, the, sa the same types of techniques that got uh, Facebook or LinkedIn to hundreds of millions of users would not work today. And, you know, I think it's a good question, uh, it's a valid question, you know, would, would even Yammer's distribution techniques work today? Because I think it's starting to, that our approach is starting to be copied quite a bit. So, I think, you know, the conclusion, therefore, is that, you know, Successful breakout startups typically innovate not just on their product, but also on distribution, right? Because if you don't invent something fundamentally new on distribution, it's, it's hard to, have, to find an advantage that hasn't been arbed out already. I want to just kind of run through how this sort of process worked uh, with, with um, sort of the ideation process with, with, with Yammer. I'll kind of go back in time to 2007. I was actually working on a different startup called, called Genie, which we launched. We had, we launched in January 2007. Um, I had started the company about six months before, and uh, Genie was a, a family uh, social network. Uh, the idea was to, to uh, create a virally growing family tree. You, know, you add your relatives, put in their email addresses, they get invited, now they join the tree. Uh, they invite other people. And, um, you know, and so right away when we launched, um, people asked us, you know, gee, this is interesting, could you do this with like an org chart? You know, and I, that kind of planned the seed for uh, corporate social networking. And, um, and you know, as the year progressed, I, I began to become, I, I got a little bit more paranoid about this idea of family social networking. You know, Facebook went from, during this time, went from being a college social network to something that clearly had broken out into, um, into more of the mainstream. And so I began to get very concerned that Facebook was eventually going to eat this family social networking space. And so I started thinking more and more about corporate so social networking. And it really seemed like it was a, there was a market need for it. You know, communication and collaboration were kind of broken inside companies. And, you know, if you kind of played out the social networking revolution to its logical conclusion, I mean, Facebook was still at about, you know, under 10 million users, but it seemed like everybody was eventually going to have a social networking account, and then you know, they would come to expect that type of communication inside the workplace as well. So if you just kind of played this out a few years, um, you could kind of see that there would be a, a need for this. But I didn't really have a specific product uh, uh, hook. You know, um, Facebook at that time was really about, this is pre-newsfeed, it was really about uh, profiles, and I didn't think that corporate profiles were interesting enough to really be a hook for users. Uh, and then in July of 2007, roughly, Twitter launched, and I should say microblogging launched, and what they did is they shifted the focus of social networking away from profiles towards the feed, right? They sort of, it used to be that you'd have to go to, to profiles to check, out every, uh, to check out what people were doing, and, um, and then, they launched newsfeed. Uh, Facebook launched newsfeed, and then Twitter came out with the, the microblogging feed, and they kind of cut out the profile middleman. You didn't have to go to profiles anymore. You just went to, to the feed to see what's going on, and that was really interesting to me because that simple status update, instead of what are you doing, we could just ask what are you working on, and it'd be a simple way to hook users and get them, get them, um, and, and get them into the product. But we were still missing kind of the the, the, the scalable distribution strategy, and um, that that kind of came to me a few months later. Uh, what we did is we just took um, Facebook's original method they use for authenticating uh, company networks, so you just, you just um, confirm your company email, and we would automatically put you inside your company network. And um, along with that came sort of a business model, which is uh, we would get the company to essentially, if they want to claim the network, they would, um, they would have to essentially buy Yammer and, uh, to get administrative control over it. And so I ended up writing the spec in December. We started coding it in January. Of 2008, we uh, dogfooded the product starting in March, and uh, we launched in September that year, and we were kind of off off to the races. Um, we, um, in terms of the non-copyability, you know, it's an interesting question about whether we ever totally solved that problem. We had a bunch of ideas on that, and um, you know, I I, I don't want to say that we sold the company because we couldn't figure that out, but I, I do think that had we figured out like just a totally uh, insuperable network effect or, or uh, something that couldn't be copied, it might have colored 
uh, differently how we um, how we viewed um, eventually the the decision to to be to be acquired. I would say you know one of the biggest learnings of Yammer is uh, is sort of this is around this combination of, of virality and and traditional enterprise sales and figuring out like a, a good balance or, or synthesis and what we essentially figured out is that virality gets you in the door of enterprises but it doesn't close the deal so um, you know what we found is that this this viral approach we had of letting any user in the company sign up uh, just by confirming their company email address was. It was incredibly valuable because it meant we didn't have to knock on the door of the, the CIO or CTO. Uh, just any employee in the company could just uh, sign up, start spraying it to their coworkers, would go viral. And it would sort of become a fait accompli inside the, the company. Uh, but that wouldn't actually extract um, dollars, uh, a sale from, from the company. We still needed humans to, to deal with uh, the IT department, answer questions um, uh, about security, about um, sort of uh, value proposition. Um, and things like that. And so we ended up essentially building a, a uh, sales team as well as having this, this, viral, uh, this viral motion. And um, both of them turned out to be, I think, uh, critical to, to our success. So people ask me all the time, well, you know, does that mean we should hire a sales team? And w what I tell founders is, well, it's a very simple question is, you know, I'm talking about professional salespeople here, right? So, you know, is your product selling today? And um, the, the usual answer is no, and I tell them, don't hire professional salespeople. You should go out and just make those initial sales yourself and validate that people actually want this product. Uh, if you go out and, and hire a big professional sales army before you validated that, it could really destroy your company, right? It really ramps up your burn rate. It changes the culture of the company. You really don't want um, professional salespeople around until you know they can be successful uh, because, you know, if they're not successful out in the world, they'll turn that energy inside the company and, and wreak havoc. So, so you know, what I really recommend for founders is do the initial sales yourself, you know, or have a small entrepreneurial team. They don't have to have any prior sales experience. I mean, it's really a myth that you need um, like really trained professional salespeople to to do uh, to get any sales uh, at all. You can really just have scrappy entrepreneurial people do do the initial sales. Um, how to set up a sales team. This is actually, there's a lot of stuff here. I don't know if I have time to go through all of it. Um, I'm just gonna save this for, for the Q&A to see if people have, have if they wanna hear about sort of a very simple way to set up your sales team, I'll, I'll run through this, but otherwise let me just kinda, or do people want me to run through it? How many people wanna hear like how you set up a sales team? Okay, so all right, I'll, I'll go through it. This is like a very simple like 80-20 rule for how you set up a sales team. First thing is just, it's all about comping this, setting up your incentives to, um, the right way. So, you know, salespeople, the term is coin operated, they'll respond to your incentives. Um, there's a thing called an OTE, that just means your salesperson's comp, their total comp, right? And it's, you want to set it to be 50% base salary and 50% variable, which just means incentive based. Okay, that's it. That's what an OTE is, it's their comp. It's their comp if they hit quota. Okay, commission rate. I recommend that you just have a 10% commission rate because it's really simple uh, until the sales rep hits their quota. And then after that, you have 15%. That's called an accelerator. So basically, once they hit their quota, they're getting a higher commission. It's just an extra incentive to put in a little bit more effort. Uh, therefore, if um, you have a 10% commission rate and you're 50% uh, you're base, 50% variable, very easy to figure out the quota. It's simply 10 times base salary, right? So that's just a mathematical relationship based on having 10% commission rate. That's one of the reasons I like the 10% commission rate. So essentially, if your salesperson says to you, hey, you know, I want a higher base salary, you just say to them, okay, well, can you, you know, if you want $10,000 higher base salary, your quota's got to go up by $100,000. Can you hit that new quota? Because if you don't, we're going to fire you. Do you really want that added stress? And they're like, oh, well, maybe I don't want the extra $10,000 in base salary. By the way, if you hit that extra $100,000, you're going to get a 15% commission rate anyway. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so you don't have to give people, you know, it's a way to create mathematical relationships that everyone can understand. Uh, the manager of the team, very simple. Add up all the individual quotas on the team. Their quota is 80% of that. You expect them to bring in 80% of the total. We know 20% aren't going to work out. That's okay. So for example, individual rep, $50,000 base, $500,000 quota at 10% commission rate, $100,000 OTE, or you could double it, 100K base, million dollar quota, uh, $200,000 OTE. Those are like very standard comp packages for an inside salesperson, should be at 50K base, or say sort of someone who's out in the field, 100K base or 150K base. Uh, just scales the quote up appropriately. By the way, you know, if you, 
if you can't, uh, if you can't hire salespeople that sort of fit these numbers, you may not have a, a product that is either priced properly or creating enough value to, to justify a sales model. I mean, typically speaking, your 50K base, um, you know, uh, inside salespeople need to have quotas of about 500K to be economically uh, justified. So let's take a manager of 10 reps. So, you know, they've each got 50K bases. Uh, so that's $500,000 quota. So it's 80% of 5 million. It's $4 million quota. They got a 100K base, $4 million quota. We'll just figure out that since they got to have 100, that if they hit 4 million, it means that um, they get 100K of variable. So it's a 2.5% commission rate. That's how you figure it out. 200K OTE, like really simple. Um, you know, again, you could have 150K base, $300,000 OTE, that'd be fine too. Uh, you just divide, the, after that, you divide the world into territories that are MISI, mutually exclusive and completely exhaustive. Okay, so completely exhaustive, the whole world is divided up, mutually exclusive, no one's territory overlaps. That's a recipe for conflict, fights, all that sort of stuff. Uh, a very simple way to do this is geo. You just look at the headquarters of the, of the uh, company so that's, you, know, you can get these out of a lot of databases. So there's never a fight about who owns a lead or a prospect. Very, very important to avoid that sort of friction. Uh, you have to feed the, leads with, feed the reps with leads. You know, if you don't give enough leads to your sales reps, they're going to be really unhappy. So this is where the distribution model comes in. Uh, Yammer had this like, amazing uh, viral lead generation machine. It basically made all of our lead gen free. Uh, so you either need something like that or another sort of equally efficient way to get those leads. Uh, and then I would say if your reps are hitting 80% or even 70% of quota within six months, this is prorated, uh, keep hiring. You know, and then you just keep splitting the world into more and more smaller and smaller territories as you keep hiring people. Uh, but again, you know, it's very simple. If you're, again, if your reps are hitting 70 to 80% within six months, so let's call it, you know, if, if your reps can do, say, 25K in six months, um, you probably should just keep hiring more of them. And then you just keep hiring them until you hit some sort of level of saturation. So let's say that the, the team achievement drops below 70%, probably want to stop and digest. And uh, that's pretty much, you can deviate from this stuff, but this is like 80%. I think it's probably correct in 80% of cases. Um, so some other just like, key, I think the key thing that, you know, um, you know, I, I previously didn't have any enterprise sales experience. And, um, you know, at PayPal, we were, uh, it was very much, Consumer play is almost completely viral. We had like five salespeople, but they were in like a basement somewhere. And uh, Keith is laughing, it's kind of true. Um, and so, you know, for me, I had to learn kind of how enterprise sales work. And my fundamental takeaway um, from not being in this world is just the key to enterprise sales is understanding that enterprises don't operate with a single mind. You know, we talk about companies like they are a person and they're sort of this, you know, in legal jargon, like they're a f this sort of, they're a fictitious person. But, um, but it's actually not the case that, you know, we talk about, well, you know, Yahoo bought, uh, you know, Tumblr today. And um, we talk about them as if they're like a person with a single mind, but it's actually a lot of different people, a lot of different incentives. And so, you know, you've got to really understand, um, you know, who specifically is your buyer inside the company? It's not good enough to say this product creates value for the company. You've got to locate a buyer. Uh, you know, do they have budget and authority? So are you, you know, who, who is that person? Do they actually have the authority to, to buy it? Do they have to go get IT's approval? Uh, can they approve the transaction size? Are you selling to, you know, an HR director who can only authorize up to $25,000, but your product's priced at $100,000 or something like that? You've got to have alignment there. What's the value prop that you're selling, not just to the company, but also to that specific uh, person? Uh, and uh, is your uh, value proposition aligned with, with that buyer? So I'll tell you one of the difficulties that Yammer had is that we created a huge amount of value for the company in terms of solving communication bottlenecks. But our buyer typically, or this uh, communication products were typically owned by IT. And your uh, individual IT person really doesn't care about communication problems inside the company. They care about not being fired because of a security leak. I mean, literally, that's, like, that's their number one concern is not getting fired because of some sort of security problem. And so, you know, Yammer's value prop actually did not align to our buyer. And so what we had to do is we had to engage IT, but we also had to engage the line of businesses. So we had engaged the marketing team, sales team, HR, and so on. And we would essentially build pressure. Uh, we would build sort of a, a consensus in the company that they needed to basically uh, buy Yammer. And, um, and uh, then we kind of got the IT people on, uh, on board in the sense that they would be better off 
uh, locking Yammer down than banning it, right? Because at the end of the day, Yammer already had gone viral in their company. It was sort of a fait accompli. And so we just had to build enough pressure that the, the IT department didn't want to ban it because that would probably be their first instinct. Uh, so we got enough supporters or champions in the business. So you've got to think about that, which is, you know, do you have fundamental alignment between your, your value prop and you've got to solve that, that, that problem. So what good enterprise salespeople do, in, in, in my experience, is first of all, they're, they're good at navigating the decision-making hierarchies within these companies, right? So these organizations are complex, and you know, good enterprise salespeople know kind of who all the players are, or they can learn, and they can kind of navigate to the decision-maker as quickly as possible. They don't waste a lot of time talking to the wrong people. And you know, what you'll frequently find is that an you know, inexperienced enterprise salesperson will come back to you and say, hey, I've got like this million-dollar deal teed up, it's all ready to go, like after one conversation, right? They'll be like, this is like, put this in like 80%, you know, this is like almost closed. And the reason they'll be way off base is they're not even talking to somebody who has decision-making authority, they'll be talking to like the champion of the product who's like some low-level IT person who loves Yammer, but really the, uh, is not the person making the decision. And then when you actually get into the deal and, and sort of inspect it, you'll find that, you know, actually we gotta go five levels up. That person doesn't even know what Yammer is, very skeptical about cloud solutions, never had the security conversation. And by the way, you know, our competitor Jive is in there selling some on-prem versions. So, you know, it's very important to, to get to your buyer ASAP. Uh, that person has to be able to articulate the value propositions. They've gotta have some ability to uh, digest your product, really understand it. They've gotta handle objections. And the key thing here really is to know which objections are real and serious and which ones can just be sidestepped. You don't want to get like bogged down in um, too many uh, in, in sort of irrelevant objections. Um, this, the sort of a good enterprise salesperson positions you uh, relative to your competitors, depositions competitors. So you've got to understand that enterprise sales, typically it's a six month, nine month process somewhere in that range to typically to close an enterprise deal. And so it's not going to happen in the first phone call. And a good salesperson will tee things up for the long term, will kind of set the landscape. They'll tell the, the buyer, educate the buyer, you know, here's what you should be looking for in an enterprise social network. You know, here are the five things that, uh, that you really need or this product won't, won't have value. And, you know, those five things will all be things that, surpri you know, surprisingly you have and your competitors don't have. Um, you know, I actually found that our, our competitors who were very good at enterprise sales, but, you know, um, were, uh, they, they were very good at doing this, which is, yeah, Yammer, you know, it's, it's got all this stuff, but they don't have, um, I don't know, like analytics or whatever, like the feature du jour was that month. And, you know, if you don't have analytics, you can't measure how valuable this is. And if you can't measure it, it doesn't have value. So therefore, they're disqualified. So like figuring out how to disqualify your competitors is, is really uh, is important. And then finally, knowing how to deal with IT is kind of an art in itself. Should you listen to the, your sales team? I guess, you know, where I come down on this is the, the biggest conflicts I had in Yammer were between my product team and my sales team. And they were constantly kind of pushing in different directions. The product team wanted to do something more disruptive and visionary. And the sales team was telling us to do features that would make buyers, i.e. IT, happy. And, you know, I think my big l takeaway from this is you should listen to your sales team for continuous innovation. You know, if you already have product market fit, if you want to, you know, create faster horses, then you listen to your sales team. If you're trying to do something fundamentally disruptive, you're trying to create a car, uh, your sales team's not going to tell you that. They're really going to mirror what your buyers are telling you. It's sort of the faster horses problem. So, you know, I think it's very important, you know, first, don't listen to the idiosyncratic feedback. If you are going to listen to your, your salespeople, make sure that, like, a lot of customers want, want that. Uh, make sure that your sales team do, it goes to war with the product you have, not the one they wish they had. So never let the fact that there's some missing features or customers have a problem with some feature be an excuse for not selling it. You, you always have to just, just make the best of the, the product that you have. It'll never be done. Uh, and then uh, I think the third thing is just don't, be careful not to over-index for, for IT or, or, or the buyer because you want to make sure that you're creating value for the end user at the end of the day. Uh, again, that was sort of the fundamental conundrum that, that Yammer had is that a lot of the features that, um, that IT wanted would actually make us less viral. We would just never do that. Um, so, okay, last slide, and I've got a minute left, so time is good. So what was in the water at PayPal? How come PayPal launched all these sort of successful companies, whether it was like, you know, YouTube, LinkedIn, Yelp, um, and so on? And, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Keith has his theory. It could be timing. It could be, uh, you, know, um, you know, eBay kind of expelled, like, everyone right away. So, like, everyone left, um, sort of, you know, it, it, it was less of a PayPal mafia than, I think, a PayPal diaspora because everyone kind of got, eBay kind of kicked, you know, burned down our temple and kicked everyone out of the homeland. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of factors. But, um, but basically, I, I actually think that what was in the water at PayPal was that we 
understood that we had to innovate on distribution, not just product. And so PayPal was one of the first with a viral product, you know, that you could email money to someone who didn't have PayPal yet. It's really fundamental. Uh, it was one of the first platform strategies. So once we realized that we had some usage on eBay, we did everything we could to stoke, to stoke that usage. And you know, I would call this an involuntary platform strategy because you know, at the time, PayPal or eBay viewed us as a parasite. Uh, and you know, today, uh, since I'd say post Facebook platform, uh, companies have a very different view of, of this type of behavior. I think now they'd be trying to encourage it. At the time, eBay was hostile towards it, but nonetheless, we were still employing a, a platform strategy. We were trying to bootstrap ourselves off of somebody else's platform. And then finally, we're one of the first embed strategies. So we actually figured out how to embed um, PayPal logos inside of eBay auctions, and it's kind of exactly the same way that YouTube uh, embedded uh, videos inside of websites back in the day, like uh, with MySpace. And um, and so we we were like I'd say very innovative on on sort of all uh, on many of the key dimensions here. And I guess what I would say is, and then you know as as we all left pay, uh, PayPal, we kind of took these lessons about distribution to, to the next company. And I guess what I'd say is. Um, it's an underrated problem because I think people just assume that if your product is good enough, it just that you won't have um, have any of these distribution problems. And I would say, yeah, there are examples you could point to, like Google or Uber, where uh, the product just took off because it was just so incredibly valuable. But I would say it's probably the exception, not the rule. I think the 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 rule is that you actually have to fundamentally innovate on distribution if you want to kind of have breakout uh, success. And you know, it's a big web out there. It's really hard for people to to find your product. So um, it's it's worth thinking about this. And I think you know, one of the reasons why there's been a PayPal mafia, but not a, say, Google mafia, is that when you're working at like a really big company that's already got guaranteed distribution and hundreds of millions of users, you really don't have to think very much about, about this problem, right? You just put your product out there. It can be a hit. It can be a miss. But you know, you're guaranteed just tons and tons of distribution. Um, and that's not, that's not true when you're a startup. So I'll end there and take any questions. Yeah, we've got Thank you, David. Yeah. We've got time for just one question, so let's make it a good one. Jeremy, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, you guys can have the slides. Uh, I, I, I told you they weren't beautiful, but you can tell I did them myself. Um, so. Uh, how do I select salespeople? You know, um, it's very hit or miss. I'd like to say we did a good job doing this, but um, the, the truth is that we churn through a lot of salespeople. Um, I guess, you know, here's the problem you have. There's a, there's a very big adverse selection problem that's worth keeping in mind. Um, really good salespeople are hitting quota, exceeding quota, whatever company they're at. And so they're, you know, they're making bank and these guys are not equity. Like they don't value equity the same way that I think entrepreneurs do. And so, you know, they're very, again, coin operated. Those guys aren't looking to leave typically. So they're very hard to recruit, especially for an early stage product that doesn't have proven adoption yet. So the reality is that you're probably going to have to ratchet up the quality of your sales team over time. You're just going to build, you're just going to hire the best salespeople you can. And then over, but you're going to realize over time, they're not the best people and you're just going to get kind of better. Um, and what I'd say is, you know, this is where like you have to have a product that's actually creating enough value that it can uh, withstand uh, like all these sort of bumps in the road, you know, and this is why, you know, I, I wouldn't even necessarily try to hire salespeople again until you've proven that your product can, can sell. Uh, simple trick though, you can look at their W2s, ask for a salesperson's W2s to, uh, to see how they actually performed. Okay. Thank you, David. Yeah, sure. Thanks.